Hi, welcome to the DRH show where I have wide ranging conversations with fascinating people. We talk about all things psychology, mental health and wellness. Today I'm joined by a psychotherapist, Karen Stylard. Thanks for joining me. Hi, good to be here. Yes, it's nice to have you here, um, Karen. Um, thank you for getting in touch with me. Um, but if you could just tell us a bit about your background, your trajectory in life and how you ended up doing what you're doing. Oh gosh, I mean, yeah, <laughs> that could be a long story. Um, so my my background, I started, I trained as an actress um, in the performing arts and I did a couple of years working for a theatre company. Um, and then after that, I was very involved in the Christian church. So I, I then decided to become a minister. So I was a church minister for quite a number of years, um, a bit crazy life really um, and my journey took me to a place where actually I needed to seek therapy for myself and I really wanted to explore I've always had an interest in mental health and um, it's always been part of my family life story um, and so I um, I got a therapist and started that journey and was absolutely amazed about the process and also about how things that I thought I could never change about myself actually were possible to change and um, yeah so that that experience was wonderful um, and then I got to a point where I just thought well I'm quite a creative human being I was finding myself getting embroiled in in stuff management stuff and things that really didn't allow my creativity to flow so I thought what can I do um, and talk to a few friends and um, one of them signposted me to um, a little college down in Islington, which is the Institute of Arts, Therapy and Education. And they did like a, an introductory course to, to um, intricative arts psychotherapy. So I did this one year foundation course um, and it just blew my mind. I can't tell you, I was like on another planet um, in terms of so excited because all of a sudden I was engaging with arts, making art. Um, and learning that actually, as I did this, something inside of me was changing and shifting. And I was able to access feelings, emotions that I knew were there, but somehow I couldn't get to them. And they just were in the shadows. All of a sudden were coming out to the surface and I was able to explore myself and learn and grow in a way that I'd never done before. So after that foundation year, I took myself off and thought, gosh, perhaps I should just train as a therapist. And uh, so I did a, a master's in integrative arts psychotherapy. Um, and yeah, that's that's where I'm at now. My, my church life has changed uh, significantly. I'm no longer a church leader, but I, um, I just love and enjoy my job. I work in a private practice um, and I see clients every day mm -hmm. uh, and we make art sometimes we talk and um, we yeah we have just really good moments of humanness um, which is what I really enjoy well, what a lovely um, journey, Karen, and thanks for sharing that to us. But um, I suppose I, what I'd like to hear from you is what exactly is integrative art psychotherapy? Um, a lot of us, um, including the listeners, have not heard of that. So what makes it distinct from other forms of psychotherapy? Uh, well, I mean, <laughs> the therapy world's amazing. It's amazing because you know it all started with Freud didn't it and then there were a few others and they split off and they had different ideas um, and over you know decades what what's happened is there are loads of really wonderful different types of theory out there like gestalt practice um, transactional analysis the psycho traditional psychodynamic stuff which is phenomenal sometimes and all of these different ways of working um, bring something new into the therapeutic space so when, I, when we use the word intricative, it means that I'm trained um, in all, all sorts of different types of theory so that I can draw from that 
in the therapy room, depending on what, what the client's presenting and what might be useful. Um, so there's a whole range of stuff. Um, and it's it makes therapy a very creative process because all the while I'm with a client, I'm going, oh gosh, perhaps a bit of transactional analysis would be really useful here. Or perhaps I could teach some neuroscience, a bit of polyvagal theory, or perhaps I need to be quite, you know, um, in the present moment and use some gestalt techniques in order to um, try and explore and, and meet with my client. So uh, the intricative part is there, but of course there's also the arts as well. So you're you're sort of also combining um, the use of the arts within the, the whole setting of the therapy room and. By using the arts, it's all sorts of different art forms that I, I can use. So the sand tray, which is a, a classic, wonderful uh, therapeutic tool. There's puppets, there's pieces of paper and pens and paints, there's clay, um, there's imagery, postcards, all sorts of things that might be useful in terms of bringing visual into the therapy room. Because what we wanna do, sometimes we get very wordy um, and that's very left brain. So we want to be able to access the right hemisphere of the brain and using art materials and visuals does that so beautifully and easily. So an intricative art psychotherapist is, is somebody who, who has all this great big toolbox and, and they will work creatively with it, bringing out the thing that might be useful for a client in the, in the moment on that day. Absolutely. Now, Cara, I'm I'm just interested. What what is it um particular about art that has got you drawn into where? Because like what you've said earlier, your background is really sort of religious, sort of spiritual. But what is there something about that uh, about art that's really got you into it? Well, yeah. I mean, the, if if we think about religion, it's really interesting. I mean, of, often there's a lot of people try and make it logical it's not really is it um <laughs> religion it, it is a, a lot of it is is in the right hemisphere of the brain it's it's metaphorical you, you've got all these amazing stories that come through the faith traditions that are just contain so much of human experience very powerful and i think when i went into the church i was fascinated by the stories how they connected with me how they made me feel um how they spoke to me how i could learn about the world through them um, of course there's lots of uh, negative aspects towards religion and that's usually to do with um power and oppression and um uh, you know abuse of different kinds so put i mean that's a big topic put that aside the thing that really caught me with faith and particularly the christian faith because that was what i was brought up with were the stories um, and the stories are um, they're not necessarily logical they make no sense i mean you think about the christian journey as a story it's like well you know the, all of it's completely bonkers isn't it you've got you've got mary who gives birth to a son but actually she's a virgin and so all this stuff is just edging on the 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 dreamlike kind of weird uh stories where things are true that can't possibly be true where you know our imaginations can go wild and we can think gosh how amazing, feed the 5,000. Um, and as we enter into that world, we're, we're entering the world of art. The world of art is the world that's expansive, it's explorative, it's curious, it breaks boundaries, it defies um, you know, rules and regulations, and, and it's a way of um, just engaging with a creative side that doesn't get stuck that can you know work its way around obstacles because there's always an imagine imaginative way forward um so that's i suppose that's the link between uh, sort of for me mm -hmm. uh, my passion about art and my background in religion mm -hmm. now um karen when, when you told me about um a storytelling um especially in reference to you know um the the, the bible i could totally relate with that because we actually have a shared experience um i was raised as a sunday school boy my, my dad was a church deacon um i was raised in a very religious family but uh, somehow it just you know turned out different i'm um, just like you i, I had 
you know, I, I sometimes have these questions about, you know, um, the stories in the Bible about faith. And of course, um, as a child, you were discouraged from, you know, questioning your faith. But um, I, I just, yeah, that, like what you said, that's another discussion. But yes, there, there is there is um, value in, 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 in um, storytelling that you can find within the Bible. And I really, really like the, the analogy that you've, you've given us, how it links with, with the art world. Um, arts is just one of your interests because um, I, I understand that trauma, curiosity and play are also fundamental um, interests that you have. Now, can you tell us what's, what's the link between these three? Like how does, you know, how does these elements um, play together, trauma, curiosity and play? Oh, well, if it, I'm very passionate about, <laughs> about these things. Um, as human beings, you know, uh, when we're safe in the world, we play when we feel safe we play and animals do you know you watch them don't you these little playful video clips of lion cubs and they're playing and they're having a lovely time um you know um and human beings are a bit like that but as soon as a predator comes into view they stop playing yeah and the the, the curiosity and the playfulness just is not allowed and it's all about survival. And I think for human beings, we're, we're exactly the same. You know, we, it, we are not able to play when we're frightened. And if we live in fear, then our window, our playful window where we can be curious and we can explore and we can, you know, poke around and find new things, um, it ceases to function. And, and that means that we are spending far too much time um, you know, in the limbic bit of our brain, fight flight mode, um, and it's not good for us as human beings. We 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 need to relax. We need to play. We need to express ourselves. And so, so I'm very curious as to where trauma stops us playing, because of course it should. You know, you, you don't want to play in the road when there's a truck hurtling towards you at 100 miles an hour. You need to stop playing, and you need to get safe. But the trouble is with us human beings is our memories kind of hinder that because past traumas keep live in our in our memory system and and we we can't play even when it is safe. Um, so I think a lot of therapeutic work is is about enabling a client to feel safer in the world somehow, um, so that they can be more playful, that they can do the things they want to do, be creative, and relate well to one another. Um, I also have a, a, you know, I'm curious about how play can be used to be to help someone feel safer, <laughs> um, as well. Because I think, you know, perhaps we need to be safe enough, and then we can begin to experiment with some play. And as we play, we begin to feel safer. What makes mm -hmm. sense? Yeah, abs absolutely. Uh, and like what you've said, what, when we actually play, we begin to feel safer. And I think this is um, one of the reasons that you've actually tried to incorporate art with your psychological practice. Um, I understand, Karen, that you've actually developed um, a story a storytelling card game called 20 Dreams. Um, if you could just tell us more about it and what's the story behind this um, card game. Yeah, I mean, I, I, it. it the simple story is, as a child, I loved playing games, um, you know, and and I really enjoyed. I think for me, sometimes life at home was a little bit stressful, or quite stressful sometimes. But the times as a family where we got together and we played a game, actually, phew, it felt so lovely. And the laughter, to laugh together, you know, it's kind of like, oh, thank goodness for that. My body's full of lovely chemicals. And... So as a child, I, I was the child that grabbed the games and said, can we play this? Um, and so I've always been fond of a good game. I like playing games with people and I love the interaction and the fun and a little bit of competitiveness. Um, and so, you know, when, it, when I was thinking about developing a game, me and my partner wanted to do a project that was a bit different. Um, and I thought, well, you know, let's create a game. Never done it before. And I thought, well, I love games, so I, I know how a good game works. So let's give it a go. And as, as I was trying to think of what type of game we might create, of course, my whole therapeutic way of being started to go in overdrive. And I thought, what if, what if we have a game 
which is all about feelings. Because often the good games like chess and <laughs> Monopoly and Scrabble, um, it's very left-brained, isn't it? There's, there's, a, there's a sort of, you've got to be very logical, rational, you know, and, and have a really good, highly functioning left brain there. What if I develop a, a game which actually the people that have got like really active right hemispheres um, in terms of creativity um, can really go to town with? Um, and so that, that's where Trend, 20 Dreams was born, really, with this idea of having a game that was based around feelings. Um, and somehow it had to be a very creative game. Um, so it's all about your own creativity rather than problem solving. It was about storytelling and the emotions that come into it. So it's trying to put language, uh, metaphorical story language to feelings. Um, and that's uh, where 20 Dreams was born. Um, and I suppose the dream aspect of it was was actually, I, while we were thinking about this game and trying to think of concepts and what might work, I literally had a dream. And in my dream, I had a dream about inventing a game <laughs> that was all about telling a dream story and you woke up feeling. Um, and that's the classic kind of question when we want to explore our dreams is what was the feeling when you wake up? What was the feeling? Because that's what we're working with is our um, feeling bank is is trying to process emotional stuff at night time. So, um, yeah, so 20 dreams kind of emerged from a dream. Mm -hmm. now, now, when you say that the, the dream aspect kind of is is like the groundwork of your card game, is that because um it's kind of being influenced by the theories of Sigmund Freud because you're a psychotherapist? Is that you're trying to, you know, um give people an outlet to express their unconscious? Is that it or I'm overanalyzing it? I well, no, I don't think you're overanalyzing it. I think I think there is some depth to it as well. I think um Absolutely. I mean, Freud said that dreams were the, the royal roads to our unconscious. And how amazing is that? You know, what, what is lurking deep within can come up through our dreams. And also, when we play 20 Dreams, you get, you get three picture cards. The story that comes is coming up from inside the person. You know, it's coming up from the unconscious. And, and so, of course, we are working with the same kind of material in a really lighthearted, fun way. You know, there's sort of all a little, a little bit of nonsense. But actually, there is something about how one person will tell a story that says they're angry um, in, in one way. And another person will use a completely different type of story to express their anger, because unconsciously we have our own versions of these uh, feeling narratives in us. Um, and 20 Dreams allows some of that in a really gentle, fun way without any analysing, just to come to the surface. And it's surprising and it's wonderful and it's like, oh, <laughs> didn't know you could you could feel angry by going down a helter skelter. But yeah, you can. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And I understand, Karin, that another element that is also embedded within your um card game is you're trying to um, help people use the language of emotion. Um, can you tell us what, why this is important? Yeah, I mean, I think, again, you know, culturally, particularly I'm British and I've grown up in the British culture and we don't really talk about our feelings. So there's a basic level of, of actually lack of language and permission to express feelings um, and a really small range of feelings. You know, I'm feeling tired. I'm feeling angry. That's it. But actually, there's so many different types of feelings out there that if we can begin to articulate them more and express them, then it helps in our relationships with others. So 20 Dreams is really a great tool, to be honest, for families, teachers, therapists, because what it's doing is it's helping somebody connect a word, an emotion that's in word form, um, to an actual narrative and feeling state. Um, and I think that's really, really, really useful um, to begin to develop a wider emotional language. Um, and it's also a game which encourages people to, to actually say, it's okay to say, well, I woke up feeling something. <laughs> Not I woke up thinking, I woke up feeling. And it's part of sharing our humanness, which is wonderful.
Mm -hmm. uh, absolutely. I'm actually personally, I'm, I'm an advocate for al allowing people to have a, an outlet, or be it creative or otherwise, to express themselves. Um, we, we've got something very similar, um, although we, we use different mediums because you use arts, whereas I use digital communication. Um, just like you, I give people a platform to express themselves. And I, I, I go along with what you said, that it's really important to allow people to kind of articulate what they're feeling because, you know, it kind of um, I allow people to, you know, um, express what they're feeling and ultimately this will lead to generating more conversations, be it, uh, you know, mental health or otherwise. And, you know, the, the more we talk about it, um, hopefully we get to, you know, address the, the negative aspects of, of mental health. Now, mm -hmm. um, of course, this is not just all based in anecdotal evidence. You're trying to, you know, um, um, uh, amplify the value of, of psychotherapeutic practice, but there's actually a science um, behind it. Um, so if you could just explain to us, Karen, um, what, what's the neuroscience theory behind your card game and how did your knowledge and understanding of neuroscience, how it influenced you developing this card game? Yeah, um, gosh, well, uh, try and keep it simple, really. Um, I'm not a scientist, so um, I tend to colloquialize for the language really badly. So I apology to anyone who is actually really an expert in this stuff. Um, but I, when I, just really quickly, when I was four, I decided I wanted to be a brain surgeon. Um, and this is the closest I've got, is actually becoming a therapist. But I think absolutely this, you know, what we know now about the brain is so helpful. We know that we've there's three parts to the brain. We've got our brain stem, we've got our limbic middle bit, and we've got the top bit, which is cortex. And we know that actually um, the cortex is has a left hemisphere and a right hemisphere. And um, there's a, a book called The Whole Brain Child by um, Tina Bryson and Dan Siegel. And it's, it's brilliant because it really explains it very simply. The fact is, as human beings, if we can use, get to a place where we can use all our brain, our whole brain, to navigate life's obstacles, then actually we thrive. We really do. But of course, it's very complex because we have to feel safe enough in the world. And we also have to develop both the left, logical, rational thinking part of the brain, and we have to develop the right hemisphere, which is the feelings and emotional um, and the creative side of the brain. Both have to be developed as children grow up. And there needs to be nice little firing neuro pathways between the two in order for a child to learn how they can both think and feel and not to be overwhelmed or stuck. Um, and I think, um, you know, our society, our Western society, particularly in this, this kind of culture and British education system, it's so left brain. It's all about thinking, problem solving and thinking by thinking. Yeah. And there is no real kind of um, emphasis or uh, uh, what's the word? Encouragement to, to feel. Um, in some ways, we're, we're taught to shut down the feeling side of us in order to just get on with it, you know? And I think that hinders the human being because we know, you know, Einstein, absolutely classic, whole-brained person. He was an amazing thinker, but his creativity was like off the Richter scale. He was using both his left and right hemisphere really, really well. Um, and he was a genius as well. But all of us have that capacity. But we need to develop new neural pathways that that help us know that we can not feelings are not overwhelming they feel overwhelming if we've not been able to process um and uh, be able to think and bring meaning to them and and so yeah so basically that's a very basic yeah <laughs> understanding of the neuroscience yeah i'm also not very good with with neuroscience but um I, I think, um, I, I, I'm not sure if you mentioned it, but I think that the technical term for it is neuroplasticity. Like if you allow your brain to, you know, use um, bits of it, it will actually kind of, you know, be, be good at it and, you, you know, develop. Um, um, uh, another thing that I want to ask you, Karen, is that you've developed um, a tabletop card game 
And um, because I'm, I'm very, I'm very digital, as you could probably tell. So why didn't you develop something like, you know, a, a digital version? Why come up with something more physical? What, what's the reason for that? Uh, probably my age, you know, but um, <laughs> no. we're probably the same age. <laughs> um, I mean, we've, we've talked about it because we, we could easily make um, a digital version of it, actually, which I think could be really beneficial at some point. Um, but there is something around um, the, a gathered community of, of bodies <laughs> in a room, uh, physically in a room. Um, so that's really helpful. So with storytelling, obviously, we do a lot of storytelling on screen now. Yeah, we have wonderful films and entertainment and, and all of that stuff. And everyone appreciates it. And it's brilliant. But it's going to live theatre is different. Something's different. There is something very much about how we can pick up so much more nuances um, and, and feelings from body language and just being in in the same physical space as one another. So that's partly the reason is, is to get the whole experience of the, of, of the game. I think actually being present together, it, it gathers a family in um, or a bunch of friends together. Um, and it's you can really see the facial expressions, you can read the body, all of that kind of stuff makes for a, a kind of whole holistic experience. And um, yeah, I'm not sure you can do that fully on the screen, but I'm very happy to be persuaded otherwise. Um, but I do think the game could easily be played. I mean, I've I've done it. Um, I've played the game with some students uh, during lockdown and we, we did it via the screen and it was fun and it worked and, as well. But I do think you lose some of the, the intimacy as well. That, that, that was actually um, my, my next question. I was going to ask you, who, who is this game aimed for? Is it for children or it doesn't really matter what age range? And also what I'm interested to hear from you, Karen, is whether this is like a competitive game like Monopoly or Rummy. Okay, so it's a game for everyone. Um, I think younger children, you, you probably have to help them out a bit and remove some of the more complex emotions. Uh, because there's a lot of them and some of them are a little bit, you know, kind of adult language. Um, so I think from 12 upwards, they're brilliant. And and often the younger person might be better at the game as well. So, you know, that's quite nice, really. The adults can struggle as much as the young people. So there's an equal footing, really, for everyone. In terms of competitiveness, it's, um, it's an interesting game. Now, I've, I've been thinking about this because I think because it's so right-brained and you have to be so creative and you're thinking about these feelings or trying to get up in touch with these feelings to tell this story what happens is the the competitive which is very right uh, left brain sort of action and um, it sort of it goes out the window you can't concentrate on that so so it's it's i would say it's mildly competitive but really at the end of the day you probably play it and nobody really cares who wins there might be a little bit of adding up at the end and going, oh, you know, I'm the best one at this. But but it's really fascinating how that it loses that co competitive edge and it's more collaborative. You know, everyone wants to hear a good story and we all want to guess the right emotion and there's a very collaborative nature to it. So in that sense, it's it's a kind game. It's a, it's a sort of happy game and it hopefully nobody's left feeling like they're really rubbish you know there's a sense of actually everyone will win points and um yeah and really the most fascinating story might not win the most points so it's creativity can win extra points if people want <laughs> sounds exciting now um karen you just hinted that there's actually an element of emotion within the game so um i understand there's emotion cards in 20 dreams so how did you actually pick these emotions where, where do they come from is it also something that you've learned because of neuroscience or is it because of you know the number of clients that you've come across i think um uh... There is there's a kind of generic list of about eight emotions that every human being has, um, and I mean how we choose to name them is is quite interesting, um, and I, I, we developed twenty of them, 
because we wanted a nice, nice long range of them, but also choosing ones. So it was quite carefully chosen, actually, because I didn't want emotions that were going to be too potentially too triggering. So there was I could have put shame. Shame could have been one of the emotions. But actually, that's that's quite potentially could be quite difficult for somebody. Um, so that's not in the pack. Um, we might do a prof sort of expert expert edition for therapists only and have shame in it. Um, so things like envy, jealousy, jealousy is in there because that's a really interesting one because I think people can understand it and but have their own version of it. So some words I think we've we trialed quite a few different types with people and then some people were like, oh, don't know, you can't put that emotion in, that's too difficult. And that was interesting as well, just uh, just to hear what what emotions would be acceptable for a, a game that's going out into the world, what emotions might be a little bit tricky, a bit difficult. Um, so yeah, carefully selected. I probably had about 40, a list of 40, and just kept going through them and then picking the ones which I felt were easy enough uh, but at the same time had a little bit of challenge to them but weren't potentially really triggering for people uh, and like what you've said you, you actually pick out the emotion that's so sort of you know everyone can universally identify like jealousy and anger of course regardless of which culture you were born um you, you would have you know you would understand what anger is um mm -hmm. But you, you mentioned earlier that this is um, a very flexible game. Um, anyone can play it. But my question to you is that what if I'm not really, because you've been talking a lot about, a lot about um, the creative aspect involved within um, 20 Dreams. What if I'm not creative? Is it really for me? Oh, absolutely. Because you are 100% as creative as I am. Um, <laughs> because it's all about getting the, the right hemisphere active. So everyone has a right hemisphere um, and, you know, you might not be a musician or an artist or anything like that, but actually everyone can tell a story. Um, it might not be the most elaborate story. It doesn't matter because everyone has feelings. And and I think sometimes we we forget, you know, we think that, oh, gosh, you know, I'm very logical. Yeah, of course, you might use your logical brain a lot. But actually, you, you do have an, another half of your brain and and it is creative. There's nothing you can do about it. It's just there, you know. So <laughs> so absolutely everyone can play 20 Dreams. Um, and, uh, you know, I've played with a whole range of people, some people who, who are the opposite of me, you know, who are incredibly logical um, and rational and um, would call themselves not really that emotional Um and they were brilliant at it, played it really nicely and really enjoyed it. So, yeah. And we've we've had a number of people who've played it with um, families that have children with autism in it. And they've really enjoyed it. In fact, it's been a fantastic way for the family to learn about how each other expresses feelings in different ways. So, yeah, I think it's it could be universal if people are brave enough to give it a go. And of course, um, the important question here, um, Karen, is that if people want to give it a go, um, uh, can they buy it online? Um, wh where is it available? And could they also watch, you know, some people on YouTube um, playing this video game so they could have like, you know, a sneak preview of how this game is played? A sneak preview. Yeah. Well, we, yes, you can you can buy it from our website, which is www.20dreamsplay20dreams.com. Um, it's on Etsy as well. You can find it there. Um, it's soon to be launched on Amazon, which we're quite excited about. Um, although we'd love other platforms to sell our game on as well. But there we go. <laughs> we have to be in the big shop too. So um, you can buy it. Um, so please do if you want to grab a coffee. There's all sorts of stuff on the website. You can, you can look at all sorts of different information on it. There's teachers packs there's pack for therapists if you want to use it in the therapeutic space um and i think there might be a, a few clips of myself and my partner playing it which i have to say are, are a bit dodgy in, in terms of uh, <laughs> but it does give you an idea of, of how the game is played um and hopefully more 
Um, there's lots of blogs that have, uh, have um, played our game. So you can read up on some of the blogs that are out there as well on 20 Dreams. So hopefully we're beginning to get a presence mm -hmm. and find out yeah. all our game. Yeah, I, I love I love to be supportive of your endeavor. So what I'll do is um I'll pop your link to the video description box. So for anyone who wants to you know explore more about your game, um they can visit your website. And you mentioned about the um blogs. You're welcome to write um a blog post for Psychridge. So you know because um m most of our readers are looking for ways to improve um positivity and mental health. So it's an open invitation for you and and your partner or anyone from your team um from twenty. Dreams. Now, so um, do you have any um, future plans, any exciting developments um, in the pipeline um, in relation to 20 Dreams or even about your psychotherapeutic practice? Um, oh, gosh. Well, I mean, <laughs> there's lots of ideas. We've got lots of ideas floating around. I'd quite like to do a game um, based around the nervous system. Um, I think that could be quite exciting. Uh, perhaps perhaps more of a board game you know something where you you've got to uh, keep your panic levels low or something I don't know but um, yeah so I've got some ideas mulling around and, and we'll see um, see whether we we can be brave enough to launch another game yeah. um, but but I think as well there's going to be hopefully if mm -hmm. we're able to get 20 good dreams properly off the ground and enough interest in it then we'll certainly develop a younger person's version um for sure so that's something that's definitely in the pipeline um mm -hmm. in the future yeah are, are you also um contemplating about having a pandemic or lockdown inspired game <laughs> well i think uh, i suspect a lot of people are planning a pandemic and lockdown game um and i suppose i suppose there are, we could draw from that um for sure as well that might be aspects certainly in a new game there may well be you know actually when a when a pandemic hits we're all gonna be you know struggling to find ways of surviving so um yeah could be interested to bring that in <laughs> Yeah, of course, um, psychotherapy and, you know, um, the, the field of mental health, it's all kind of reactive to actually the needs of of um, society. Um, if, if I could just share myself, um, just just like I'm also trying to develop um, intervention and because my interest lies within blogging. So I'm trying to, you know, um, explore the viability of blogging as a resilience in, resilience intervention. And so some people are not really, you know, I, I'm buying the idea, but I'm really quite passionate about um blogging and digital communication so i could have you i could have um really relate to what you're you're doing um when it comes to you know promoting um the value of storytelling when it comes to promoting positivity mm -hmm. now um karen um who who inspires you both professionally and and personally oh gosh who <laughs> inspires me i suppose the, the people that inspire me the most are my clients really I have to say, I'm um, when I I have the privilege of hearing people's life stories and seeing their pain and and hearing their pain and and seeing how they've survived in the world. It's absolutely inspirational. Um, so my clients are are my first port of inspiration. Um, otherwise, I've got to say there are some amazing professionals out there that I've met who I just think are phenomenal, doing an amazing job. Um, Margot Sunderland, who's done a lot around uh, children, uh, young people, psychotherapy, who set up the college that I went to and who's got numerous publications and founder of various different... She's an amazing entrepreneur um, and is really inspirational in terms of um, really, really putting the arts and psychotherapy and empathic responding to the forefront um, as much as she can. So she's an inspirational figure for me. Um, and just loads of other people. I mean, classic, um, Irvin Yalom, if you can read some of his stuff. Oh, what an amazing therapist. And you sort of think, gosh, how amazing to, to be able to be so present for people in that way. So he's he's my, um, my favoured uh easy read uh psychotherapy uh author 
Now, another thing that I want to ask you, Karen, is that, um, of course, um, you have a background in religion and you also now have a background in psychotherapy and, you know, cr creative outlet. Now, if there's, um, you know, a few misconceptions about those areas that you would like to address, uh, what would those misconceptions be? Oh, gosh, um, I think, I mean, it's a hard one um, because I completely understand why people dismiss both religion and therapy for probably similar reasons to be quite honest because it feels intrusive abusive potentially there's a lot of power dynamics going on in both fields um i, I think for religion i would i would say um actually uh, number two most helpful thing people uh, who've gone through the psychiatric system uh, the second most helpful thing that they say is that they can pray um, and I think you know re religion and faith groups provide a framework for prayer and meditation which really helps people's mental health really really does so um, so I think we need to bear that in mind and really respect that um, the space also, I think there's something about the, the the storytelling, the ancient stories, and us having a narrative. And I think faith groups and religion hold narrative over time. And I think we need that as human beings. We need to feel connected to our ancestors and our past. And there's huge value in that and community. Um, so so uh, I'm the first person to be deeply critical of, of faith groups and religion. But I still stand in a position to say, actually, they are hugely beneficial to us as human beings and, and should be welcome part of community life. Um, obviously, it's not very nice when they get a bit kind of like, you have to believe this. Don't think that's helpful. Um, in terms of therapy, um, I think um, there, you know, there's just this myth that you, you know, there's something wrong with you if you've got to go to therapy. Um, and I would say absolutely not. Uh, we've got to get rid of that because actually therapy is just another way a human being can develop and grow and learn. So if you believe in education, then, then I would say you need to believe in therapy too, because a good therapist can help somebody really actualize into who they want to be and where they want to go in the world. It's, you, don't, you don't have to be screwed up or, you know, do you know what I mean? That's, that, there's a kind of myth that there's something wrong with you, that um, you're not coping in life if you go to therapy. That's, absolute nonsense I think um, and most people that have done the therapeutic journey would would say gosh that that was worth the money you know that that's really helped me get to where I want to be um, and um, yeah now um Karen if if there are people who are watching this or listening to this and wants to follow your footstep about being an integrative art psychotherapist um could you recommend um good sources um be it TED Talk or a textbook perhaps, or some some um, organizations. And what would be your advice for, for those who wants to venture into becoming a psychotherapist? What what makes a good uh, or an effective psychotherapist? Uh, I think, you know, um, obviously you've got to like people, I think. <laughs> so if you don't like people, then don't become a therapist. Yeah. That's not, probably not, not great. Um, but I, I think if you... Uh, if you if you like to be in touch with your feelings and you really want to have that connection with another human being, then therapy might be the way forward in terms of training, because um, that's my greatest joy is, is I, you know, I have the privilege of having meaningful conversations every day. Oh, it's, oh, it's lovely. <laughs> it's really nice. Um, and, and I think, you know, if you like, if you want more of that, then, then that might be a good reason to, to go and, and do a little bit of training. There's all sorts of stuff out there that you can try. There's loads of little short courses. Um, uh, the British Art Association of Therapists, um, BAAT, you can look up on their website and they do all sorts of courses where you could just dabble you know you can just go and do something and see whether you like it in terms of using the arts um and yeah just sign up to something do a bit crazy something <laughs> and join in and and uh, yeah and then obviously 
there are some brilliant, brilliant courses out there if you want to train properly. So you just have to do your research. And, and you've got to find the right course for you as well, because I think um, you've got to really think about, you know, if you want to be a psychoanalyst, you've got to be a certain type of person for that. So it fits nicely. Um, so really think about who you are, where your preferences are, and then you can find the right course for you. Absolutely. And um, what's the big message for, um, for from Karen? Um, I suppose you, you've been trying to do a number of things, you know, from, you know, you used to be part of the spiritual community and now you're venturing into psychotherapy and developing a card game. But what, what's the big message from you? Oh, gosh, I suppose I mean, this touches on what you're, you're passionate about, Dennis, is, is actually our stories are hugely important. They really matter, our narratives and our stories. And I think um, I'm really passionate about that. I'm, uh, I think, if, yeah, human beings are incredible and we have an amazing story. Um, every individual is different. We've, we're so fascinating and so complex. But the stories also go down the generations, you know. So I think hearing the ancient myths and legends are so rich for us human beings but also our ancestors stories and learning about them it, all of that piecing it together and then our own narrative um, and being able to write our narrative tell our narrative share our story so that we feel connected to others I'm really passionate about that and i think it's um you know that's what makes us feel alive is it's when we can feel connected yeah. connected to nature connected to one another absolutely and like what you've said much of our life beavers in, in storytelling every one of us has a story to share and like what you've said maybe um we could kind of you know convey our, our own narrative our own story through you know a number of creative outlets such as um your your card games now um i would imagine you have a very stressful life especially during the lockdown so um how do you relax what's your de-stressing outlet <laughs> how do i relax well oh yes it's it's been a stressful time isn't it and i've i've noticed that actually i've needed more relaxing stuff than normal and i suspect most people have found that um i swim in the reservoir which is a joy now the now the summer's come i didn't do it in the winter a bit too cold i'm not brave um but that's that's just lovely just the cold water and the, the, the brightness and the wonderful so swimming i love going out for food i really miss that when all the restaurants were shut but now we can go back out for meals and I, I love a nice glass of wine. Um, I enjoy watching various series on uh, screening Netflix and BBC iPlayer and all of that stuff. Um, and just, um, yeah, being with my family, people I love, um, friends, they, all of those sorts of things, love to relax. And I enjoy um, creating, so I do painting um, and uh, just love just making a piece of artwork when I get a bit of time. Oh, oh and one other thing that I really love doing um, is I brew beer, and uh, and that brew day is really cathartic. It's it's like baking bread, you know. It takes the whole day, um, and that brewing process, and it's very satisfying when you get a delicious bubbly beer at the end of it as well. Yeah, I bet. Um, and what do you think you would be doing if you didn't work as a psychotherapist or someone who develops um, kind of creative outlets? Oh, gosh, what would I be and doing? Don't, don't tell me you would end up um, becoming a church minister. <laughs> no, I don't. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I think the, I mean, I, I think I will always be committed at some, uh, to a church community because I believe in community and I like being part of a place where I meet people that are very different from myself. And I think that's that's really important. But I'm not sure about church leadership in the future. Um, I think what I'd love to do if I, if I could do is, is I'd love to just like have a few clients, just, but actually to be an artist, that's my secret. My secret desire is to have a studio and to uh, be able to just create uh, artwork all day. Um, and then um, I'd be very, very happy. But I think that might be my retirement plan. So. 
uh, do, do, do give us a, an update in the future how um, it pans out. Okay, um, thank you for that, Karen. And finally, um, if people wanted to reach out to you, what platform can they get in touch with you at? And again, remind us again of your website and also where can we get hold of your card game? Okay, so the card game is called 20 Dreams and the website is www.play20dreams.com. Um, you can contact us um, via that website, but if you want to uh, get get in contact with me um, via my therapeutic practice, then um, I have a company that's called Feeling Found. So, and you can find me at www.feelingfound.com, um, and you can contact me via my website there. So, um, be lovely to hear from you if you've got any thoughts, any comments, um, or just want to say hi. And love to hear from you. And um, if, if you like this video, like what any good YouTubers would say, um, leave, leave some comments here. So also um, Karen could read out your, your comments. Um, Karen, it's a pleasure having you here on the VRH show, but unfortunately our time is up. T thank you for sharing to us your 20 dreams card game and also about your therapeutic practice. Um, I look forward to hearing more about your work. Thank you. Thank you, Jane, it's been a delight.